Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, this is uh, my second video <clears throat> on section 4.2 uh, about the addition rule and the multiplication rule. So this is part two. Make sure you've already watched uh, 4.2 part one uh, because in, in the previous video I talked about the formulas for the addition rule, the multiplication rule, and also the complement rule, and I did some more basic examples. Now, in this video, we're going to be um, focusing on uh, four of your homework problems. And uh, remember that your homework problems will have different numbers when you're doing them, so you're still going to have to redo them on your own. But um, I'm going to use those four homework problems as examples in this video because uh, your homework covers stuff that's not on the slides entirely because we have to deal with tables and finding probabilities uh, looking at a table. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at those problems. So for starters, uh, we're going to start with question number five on your homework. Okay, so as you see here, um, they want us to use the data in the following table which lists drive through accuracy at popular fast food chains. They say, assume that orders are randomly selected from those included in the table. Okay. Um, so for this question, they're asking us, if one order is selected, find the probability of getting food that is not from restaurant A. Now, there are two ways you can do this problem. Um, one way would be using the complement rule, uh, and then the other way would be to just look at, um, hold on, let me change the view here. So, um, there we go, that was the button I meant to press. Okay, so. Um, so if we want to find the probability of getting food that is not from restaurant A, realize that this, this first column here represents all the orders from restaurant A. Now, a good thing to do when you have a table like this is to add up each column and then also add up each row. And then... Um, after you've done that, then you can add up either the numbers at the bottom or the numbers on the side to get the total number of data values. Okay, so before we even answer their question, when you have a table, um, in many cases it's helpful to just go ahead and add up each column. So let's do that first. So here our first column is 320 plus 33. So 320 plus 33 is 353. So for this first column, uh, right directly below the column, I write the total for that column. And what that 353 represents is the total number of orders that were from restaurant A. Okay? And you don't necessarily have to always add up all of the columns, but let's just go ahead and do it for this first example. Okay, so if we added up the second column, it would be all the orders from restaurant B, so 273 plus 60. So 273 plus 60. So the second column adds to 333. 3, 3, 3. And then the third column is going to be 245 plus 36, which is 281. Okay, so I gotta need to write a little bit smaller here. So 281 is the third column, and then the fourth column would be 122 plus 15, which is 137. Okay. And we may not need to add up all of these columns on every single problem 
but I'm just going to go ahead and do it for this problem. Um, and then you can also do the same thing for the rows if needed. So um, really on this problem, we probably don't need to add up the rows, honestly. But let's just go ahead and do it for practice. So if we add up this first row, then we can write the total over here on the right side. So if I add up this first row, it's going to be 320 plus 273 plus 245 plus 122. So the total for this first row should be 960. So that is 960. And then we can do the same thing for the second row. So for the second row, we have 33 plus 60 plus 36 plus 15. All right, so the second row adds to 144. Okay. Um, all right. And then we can go ahead and um, we can find the total number of orders by either adding up all of these numbers on the bottom or adding up these numbers straight down. So we don't need to add up these plus those. That would be double counting. But um, for example, uh, on this problem, if you didn't add up the rows, you could also just add up these four numbers to get the total. Okay, so right here on the bottom right corner, this is where people usually will write the total. Okay, so let me switch um, to just the camera. Okay, so that's a little bit easier to read. So um, what you need to do now is, in order to get the total number of orders in the entire uh, table, either add up these four. So if we do that, we get 353 plus 333 plus 281 plus 137. That gives us a total of 1,104, 1,104. Um, and then, like I said, the other way you can do it to get the same number is you can just add up this column here. Because if you add up these two numbers, this should be the same exact number as adding up these four numbers, since when we totaled the first four columns, that's also going to be the same as totaling the first two rows. So if you try adding 960 plus 144, you're going to find that you, on your calculator, you still get the same total. So 1,104. Okay. And, um, you know, based on the problem, you may or may not need to do this much work as I did here. But there's certainly no harm in doing in adding up all the columns and adding up the rows and then finding the total. All right, so then once you have that information, you can use that information and um, read what they're asking for to answer their question. So let me switch back to the, the PC view here. Uh, sorry, this thing is acting up today. There we go. That's what I wanted. Okay, so what they're asking us is to find the probability of getting food that is not from restaurant A. Okay, so we want to find the probability of getting food that is not from restaurant A. So um, to do that, really all we have to do... Why is this thing being uh, so uh, moody today? Oh, there we go. So to get, to get all the orders that are not from restaurant A, just realize that this first column, which totals to 353, this first column represents all of the orders that are from restaurant A. So if we want to get all the orders that are not from restaurant A, we can just add up the other three columns. Okay? So what I'm saying is, 
the probability of food that's not from restaurant A. From rest, I'll just write not from restaurant A. Well, if it's not from restaurant A, it has to be either from restaurant B, restaurant C, or restaurant D. And because we've already added up um, each of these columns, we can see that if we add up these three numbers, that will be the total number of orders that are not from restaurant A. So in other words, if it's not from restaurant A, it, it has to be 333 plus 281 plus 137. Okay, so our numerator is all of the outcomes in our event. And then our denominator, the nice thing about doing the total like I did on this bottom right corner, is your denominator in all these problems is just going to be your total. So here our total is 1,104. So that's going to be our denominator, so 1,104. And like I said earlier, um, the other way to do this problem would be using the complement rule. But um, I feel like when you're dealing with a table, the complement rule is usually more trouble than it's worth. So if we find when they say not from restaurant A, it's usually easier to just circle all the columns that are not from restaurant A and add them up rather than having to do um, the probability that the orders are from restaurant A and then having to do one minus that. Okay, anyway, so we can go ahead and calculate this probability that they asked us for. So adding up these numbers in the numerator, we have 333 plus 281 plus 137. So that should give you 751 out of 1104. Okay, so 751 over 1104. And then if we return to the actual question, um, they say to round to three decimal places. Whenever they say to round to three decimal places, obviously they don't write they don't want you to write your answer as a fraction. They want you to write it as a decimal. And because they're saying round to three decimal places, we're going to go ahead and do that. So, going back to my work here, if we go ahead and do this division on our calculator, 751 divided by 1104 gives us 0 0.6802. And then if we round that to three decimal places, that rounds to um, 0.680. Okay, so that is the probability that we want. Okay, so 0 0.680 is the probability of randomly selecting one order that is not from restaurant A. In other words, it has to be either from restaurant B, restaurant C, or restaurant D. Okay, so let's go ahead and type that in, 0 0.680. Excellent. All right, so we got it. All right, and then I have to erase all this, but while I'm doing that, let's go ahead and go on to the next question that I wanted to go over. Um, so question number seven is a bit more challenging. That's why I'm going over it. Question number seven from your homework. So here we have a, a very similar table. I think the numbers might be a little different this time because like I said, it randomly, uh, my math lab randomly generates the numbers each time. So we still have the four drive through restaurants um, labeled restaurant A, restaurant B, restaurant C, restaurant D. And then the first row represents all the orders that are accurate. And the second row represents all of the orders that are 
not accurate. Now, what they want us to find here in this problem is a bit more complicated than what we did in the last problem. So if one order is selected, they want us to find the probability of getting an order from restaurant A or an order that is accurate. Okay. So we want to find the probability that an order is from restaurant A, so I'm just going to write A, or a rest, an order that is accurate. Okay, so now here, uh, the way most people would do this would be using the addition rule that I presented in the previous video. So in the previous video, we talked about the addition rule. Um, so the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Well, here, instead of B, we have accurate. So probability of A plus the probability of accurate. And then to avoid double counting, we said we had to do minus the probability that they both occur. So the probability of A and accurate. So this right here is just the addition rule. So remember when, when they're using the word or, that's when you use the addition rule. So this is the addition rule. Okay, so the bad news is it's a bit more complicated, but the good news is I will show you the easiest way to use this formula. So uh, in order to do this formula, the standard way to do it is to just focus on each part of the formula individually and then write down your numbers, and then at the end, we'll plug it into our calculator. Okay, so let's start with the probability of an order from restaurant A. So returning to the problem, um, the probability that our order is from restaurant A is going to be, well, once again, uh, a is the first column, so we would, we would like to go ahead and add up the first column, just like we did on the last problem. Okay, so if we add up this first column, that will represent all the orders from restaurant A. So in this first column, we have 340 plus 38, which is going to be 378 orders from restaurant A. Okay, and then, um, so for our formula, the probability of A means that, well, since there were 378 orders from restaurant A, that means our numerator here is going to be 378. And then, um, actually, let me write this let me write this down here so I don't get in the way of the table when we're looking at the table. So let me let me take this and write it down here. So this is going to be equal to we have 378 orders in restaurant A. And then our total number of orders we can get if we add up all these numbers in the table, we can get the total number of orders or alternately uh, we can just add up each column like we did last time and then find the total that way. Either way is fine. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and add up the columns. So if I add up the second column, I've got 266 plus 53, which is 319. Okay. If I add up the third column, I have 232 plus 40, which is 272. Okay, and then if I add up the last column, I have 135 
plus 19. And honestly, I could probably just add these up in my head. I don't know why I'm using my calculator. Probably because I don't feel like thinking. That's usually why people use their calculator. Okay, and then we can go ahead and get the total, uh, just like we did before in the last problem, by adding up um, all of these columns. So if we add up all these numbers on the bottom, that will give us the total. So 378 plus 319 plus 272 plus 154 will give us our total, which here happens to be 1123. 1,123. Okay. So I'll tell you a little tip about this addition rule. Like I said, once you find the total, that's actually going to be your denominator for all of these probabilities. So if we add up these two probabilities and subtract that probability, honestly, the easiest way to do it on your calculator is to just go ahead and... Um, write all of these all over the total. Just ends up being less work that way. So our denominator is going to be 1, 1, 2, 3, which is the total, adding up all these columns. And then our numerator, 378, is going to be giving us the probability that an order is from restaurant A. Now, the other thing we have to do is find the probability that an order is accurate. So to find the probability that an order is accurate, we're going to be adding that to the 378. So the probability that an order is accurate, we're going to put right here. Um, now here, in this problem, uh, order is accurate is going to be this second row. So in order to get the number of orders that were accurate, we have to add up all of the orders I don't know why I said the second row. I meant to say the first row. Uh, one of those days today. Okay, anyway, order accurate is the first row. So 340 plus 266 plus 232 plus 135. So if I add up this first row, the total for that row is going to give us 973. have to write very small here. Okay, so the probability that an order is accurate is going to be 973 accurate orders in this first row divided by 1,123 orders total. But we can just plug that in here. And notice I'm writing these all over the total because they're all going to have this denominator anyway. All right, and then the last thing we need to calculate is we actually have to subtract the probability that an order is from restaurant A and the order is accurate. So how do we do that? Well, um, we don't really have to use the multiplication rule. In fact, there's a lot easier way of doing this than using the multiplication rule. So if we look at the table, um, we can just look at the overlap. So if you look at, um, when they say the word and, technically they, that means the multiplication rule. But when you have a table, instead of thinking of the word and as multiplication, think of the word and as the overlap. And that's just an easier way of doing um, that kind of probability. So if we're looking for the overlap of A, well, restaurant A would be this first column. So this first column is restaurant A. And then we want to find the overlap of restaurant A, which is the first column with accurate. Well, the orders that are accurate would be this first row. 
Sorry, I'm having to be very careful here so I don't cover any of these numbers, hopefully. So bear with me. Uh, this is very small. It's hard for me to see what's going on. Okay. Anyway, all of that, the point of all of that is um, the word and means overlap. So you're looking for the intersection over, or the overlap, which here, the intersection of restaurant A, which is the first column, order accurate, which is the first row, is this number right here, which if you're having trouble seeing, let me switch to the other view, which is 340. Okay, so there were 340 orders that were from restaurant A that were accurate, which is the same as saying um, the probability that an order is from restaurant A and the order is accurate is 340 out of our total, which was 1123. Okay. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, anyway, that's, if you're using the addition rule, like I'm using here, that's probably the, the easiest way that I know of doing this problem, um, using the addition rule. Okay, so then all we have to do now is, um, Remember that this 340 that we just did was actually, um, we're subtracting it because it's this part of the formula. So minus the probability that an order is from A and it's accurate. So that gave us this right here. All right, and then um, on our calculator, the easiest way to do this is to go ahead and do the top first. So the numerator, so we do 378 plus 973 minus 340. Okay, so that gives us 1011, 1011. And then our denominator, like I said, is always gonna be the total. So our denominator here is 1123. And then they want us to round to three decimal places, which means we have to divide on our calculator. So 1011, 1011 divided by one, one, two, three. And then rounding to three decimal places, we've got 0 0.9002, which just rounds to 0 0.900. Okay, so 0 0.900 is this probability. Okay, and um, I know that was quite a bit more work than the first problem, and uh, if any of it was hard to read, I just went ahead and switched to this view here so you can, you could, you know, take a picture of the screen or just finish taking your notes. Um, but yeah, that is a, a detailed example of using the addition rule. So remember, for the and part, just look at the overlap whenever you have a table. That's way easier. All right. <clears throat> So what we got was 0 0.900. So while I erase this, let me go ahead and also type that in. So we got 0 0.900. Hopefully we were correct. Yeah, it says fantastic. Okay. Now um, we can see there's actually another part to this problem. So let's start looking at that while I'm erasing. So it says, are the events of selecting an order from restaurant A and selecting an order that is accurate, are they disjoint events? So if you, if you hopefully have watched part one of this video from this section, I talked about disjoint events. So disjoint events are events that don't overlap. So here, uh, I want you to think about this for a second. Are these disjoint events? In other words, do these events overlap? You can always pause the video and think about it. But 
Okay, but to most of you, this is probably pretty obvious because we were just talking about um, the overlap. So the thing is, we just found the overlap, which was there were actually 340 orders in the intersection of restaurant A, which is the first column, and order accurate, which is the first row. So unless this number were zero, unless there was no overlap, these are not disjoint events. Remember, disjoint is like disconnected, so they would be two events that don't have any overlap. Here we definitely have an overlap. In fact, we have 340 orders in the overlap. So these are not disjoint. Not disjoint. Okay, and then let's see if we can go ahead and actually fill in the answers here. So the events blank, well, we just said the events are not disjoint because it, well, let's see what they said. So here's a blank. It blank possible to, um, so the only one that really makes sense here is receive an accurate order from restaurant A. So because it is possible to receive an accurate order from restaurant A. In other words, there were actually 340 orders that were both accurate and from restaurant A. The events are not disjoint. In other words, because they have an overlap. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, and uh, so that, yeah, that one's a little bit tougher than question number five, so I'm glad that we went over it in detail, because um, that was probably one of the, probably the most challenging problem in this whole homework. Okay, so then the next problem that I wanted to go over um, uh, was question number 10, and then also question number 11. So afterwards. So for question number 10, it says uh, use the data. This is another table. This table is a little bit smaller. Um, it only has two columns and two rows. And this table uh, lists the survey, re survey results from high school drivers who are at least 16 years of age. Um, and in this survey, they were asked whether they texted while driving or whether they did not text while driving. And then, so those are the first two rows. And then the columns are answering the question, did you drive when drinking alcohol? So the first column said yes. The second column said no. Um, now, this problem wouldn't be too hard uh, if they were just asking um, the probability that one high school driver uh, drove while drinking alcohol. But here, uh, what, the, what makes this problem challenging is they say if four different high school drivers are randomly selected, find the probability that they all drove when drinking alcohol. So uh, question number nine is pretty similar to this, and it's a lot easier because they're just going to ask you about one high school driver. It's going to be like this, the same table with different numbers. Um, but what, what makes this one hard or harder is they're actually asking the probability that four randomly selected high school drivers all drove when drinking alcohol. So before we dive into this, I do want to mention, um, in the previous video, we talked about the multiplication rule. Um, so here we're going to be using the multiplication rule, but we need to write a more general version of it. 
So th remember that the multiplication rule was um, a method of calculating probabilities using the word and. So if they're using the word and, and we aren't just finding the overlap like in a table, um, the way the multiplication rule works is if you have the probability of A and B, then that's the same as the probability of A times the probability of B given A. But if the events are independent, which means that the probability of the first event doesn't affect the second event, the multiplication rule basically just says when they use the word and, you multiply. Okay, so and means multiply is sort of the the shortened down version of what we learned in the last video. So what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to realize that since we're selecting four high school drivers or four people who took the survey, um, what they're asking us to find here is a probability that all four of them drove when drinking alcohol. And we need to rewrite that using the word and. So how do we do that? So we're, we're trying to find probability that all four, oh geez, it's bad out there. Probability that all four, um, let's just write DUI, drove under intoxication, drove while drinking alcohol. Well, how do we rewrite this with the word and? Well, it's really the probability, um, just for shorthand, I'm just gonna write the first was DUI and the second was DUI. I'm just gonna write first and second and third and fourth. And I'm not writing DUI over and over again because there's not enough room to write it on this board. Um, anyway, my point here is even though we have not just two events, we actually have one, two, three, four events. And means multiply. And if the events are independent, which here we can treat them as independent because there are so many people in this study. There um, thousands of people in this study. Um, so uh, we can treat the events as being independent, even though they didn't say that they put the drivers back. It's just because there's so many, we just treat the events as independent. So we're just going to replace all of these and words with multiplication. Okay, so in other words, this is going to be the probability of the first DUI times the probability of the second driving under intoxication times the probability of the third DUI times the probability of the fourth DUI. Okay. And when I'm writing it out like this, it looks kind of complicated. But once you realize what I'm actually explaining here, all I'm saying is that you just mul you find the probabilities and you multiply them all, and that's it. And because they're independent, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the chances of the second one being affected by the first and so forth. So we can literally just find the probabilities and multiply them. So if we return to the actual problem, um, once again, we're probably going to want to um, find the total of the rows and the columns. Okay. So let me switch to my overlay view here, and then I'm going to have to erase a little bit so we can actually read the table. Why is this thing acting up so much today? I keep pressing this button and it's not. Okay, there we go. All right, so, so sadly, in order to read the table, I'm going to have to erase this stuff up here. But that's just teacher's life, you know. We 
have such a tough life. Um, but I'm going to keep this part down here. So the summary of, of all of the stuff that we just went over is that we can just multiply all this stuff. All right, so looking at this table, we're going to go ahead and now uh, add up the columns, and then we'll add up the rows and also find the total. So adding up the first column, we have 746 plus 131. 746 plus 131. So for this first column, I have to write small here. We have 800, 877, sorry. Okay, so 877 in the first column. And then in the second column, we have 3031 plus 4384. So that will be the total number of people who said no. So that's 7415, 7,415 of the people in the survey said no, they didn't drive while drinking alcohol. And then we can do um, the total for each row. Okay, so for the first row, we have 746 plus 3,031, 746 plus 3,031. So that gives us 3777, 3777, oh, that's a bad seven, let me rewrite that one. You know, I should probably take like a, a class on writing small, because all the caffeine I drink makes me jittery and it's hard for me to write that small. Okay, and then for the second row, we have 131 plus 4384. So the second row adds up to 4515. 4515. Okay, and then uh, to get the, the number in the bottom right corner, we can just go ahead and either add up the columns or add up the rows. They should both add up to the same total. So I'm just going to go ahead and add up um, the rows. Sorry, the columns. I pointed at the wrong one. Um, so adding up the columns here, we've got 877 plus 7415, which is 8292 as our total. Okay. So this total is 8292. Okay, and then um, to figure out these probabilities, they're all going to be over the total. And then we just need to figure out the numerator of each fraction. So returning to the problem, um, each probability, they want us to find the probability that someone drove while drinking alcohol. So if they drove while drinking alcohol, um, that's going to be um, the people who said yes. OK? So the people who said yes is going to be the same as the total of this first column. OK? So switching back to this view. We can see that there were um, 877 people, 877 high school students who said yes, that they drove while drinking alcohol. And um, because these are, because there are so many people in this study, we can treat these as independent events. So now we can just multiply each of these. And each of these is going to have the same probability because um, there are still 877 
people who said yes over, we said there were 8292 total. And then just like with the other problems, because the denominator is always the total, to put it in your calculator, you can actually just write all of these over our total, which was 8,292. And then here, because we're multiplying, we've got 877 times 877. Actually, I lied. <laughs> I lied. We can't write it all over that total. I don't know what's, got, what's up with my brain today. Uh, unlike when we're adding or subtracting, we can, we can write them all over the total. But when you're multiplying fractions, you actually have to, to multiply the denominator. So um, I apologize for that. Um, I'm just going to leave that in the video, though. I, I don't feel like it's uh, that big of a mistake because I caught it in time. Um, yeah, so I just kind of had a, a hiccup, a brain fart there. Yeah, so because these because it's multiplication, we do actually have to write all of these out. Um, and we're, we're going to have to multiply both the top and the bottom. All right, so it's going to be, uh, but each one is going to be the same. So it's going to be 877 over 8292. So each denominator is going to be the same. So it's going to be 8292, 8292. 8292 and 8292. Now, um, the numerators are all going to be the same. So there are 877 for each one. And they don't really say it here, but um, they want you to assume that after they select the first person for the survey, they're putting that person back in the pool and then they're randomly selecting the next person. That's why all these numbers should be the same. So, I mean, you might be thinking, well, if I select the first person and I didn't put them back, if I did not replace them, then the next probability might be one less for these numbers. But here, I think they're assuming that there are so many people that they're just going to uh, approximate it. So all these numbers are the same. Okay. And then um, when you are multiplying fractions, you can multiply straight across. Uh, so if you're multiplying fractions like this, you can multiply the top and then multiply the bottom. But the problem with, with this one is that these numbers are going to be very large. So we're going to have on the top 877 times 877 times 877 times 877. That gives you a huge number in scientific notation. So it might be better, rather than doing it in two steps, it might be easiest to, if you combine all these into one fraction, which you are allowed to do, and then um, you do it all in one step. That's what I would recommend. And then it won't give you a number in scientific notation. But if you do type it into your calculator all at once, you do need to put parentheses around both the numerator and the denominator. Okay. So in the numerator, we have parentheses 877 times 877 times 877 times 877. And I don't want to press enter. So I went ahead and typed all that into my calculator in the numerator. Uh, multiplying straight across the numerator. I put parentheses around it, and now I'm going to go ahead and divide, and then I use parentheses around the denominator. So in the denominator, we have 8292 times 8292 times 8292 times 8292. Those parentheses around the numerator and the denominator are very necessary. Do not skip those. If you skip them, you're going to get the wrong answer. So after we do all that, then we finally get a decimal. So the decimal that I got here, um, is a small number. So it's 0 0.000125. Okay. And, uh, I went ahead and rounded to three 
significant figures, which means when I started at the first non-zero digit, I went ahead and included that one and two more digits. So there are three non-zero digits, and then I rounded. Okay, and then we'll just make sure that that's what they say to do before we write it down. So yeah, it says round to six decimal places as needed. Um, which is essentially what we did here. So when they say six decimal places, that's the same. Well, in this problem, that's the same as three significant figures because the first three digits are zeros. So those don't count towards significant figures. So only these last three digits uh, count for significant figures. Okay, so that one's a little bit more challenging. Uh, but once you realize that you just multiply the probabilities, and hopefully your calculator has parentheses, so you can do it this way and do it all at once, then it's hopefully not too bad. Okay, so we got 0 .000125, so let's type that in. All right. And then um, I did also want to go over question number 11, which um, hopefully will help us understand the multiplication rule even better. So um, this question has multiple parts, but this is easier than the last question. I, I think most people are going to find this easier than question number 10. But I did want to go over it just so that we can feel really solid on the multiplication rule. Probably the only thing that's challenging about this one, number 11, is um, they're giving us a percentage. So they're saying the principle of redund redundancy is used when system reliability is improved through redundant or backup components. Through redundant or backup components. So that's interesting. That's the science behind it. But uh, all, we're, all we're really caring about here is the math. So for the math, it says, assume that a student's alarm clock has a 12.5% daily failure rate. So when they give you a percentage you need to convert it to a decimal before you do any probabilities. Okay, so let's just do that first before we do any other questions. So they gave us 12.5%. That's a percentage. If we convert it to a decimal, that means we need to move the decimal two places to the left. Okay, so that means the probability of a single failure is going to be 0.125. Okay. So that gives us 0.125 if we move the decimal two places to the left. And remember, even though percentages make more sense to most people in the real world, when you're actually doing the math, you want to have everything written as a decimal. So that's why we converted it to a decimal. So when they say the daily failure rate, they're talking about for one alarm clock. Okay. So that means there's a 12.5% chance that a single alarm clock won't work. And obviously, these must be really cheap alarm clocks, because most alarm clocks have a lot lower chance of failing than that. But they're, they're, they're making it high enough that um, the math is easier to do in this problem. OK, so let's take a look at their first question here. What is the probability that the student's alarm clock will not work on the morning of an important final exam. So here, they're saying alarm clock, not alarm clocks. So they're just talking about one alarm clock. And we know one alarm clock has a 12.5% daily failure rate. So the probability of one alarm clock failing is just going to be 12.5% written as a decimal, which we already did. So that's 0.125. Okay. So I, I'm going to try to give myself a lot of room here. So let me go up here. 
um, probability of, let's just write um, first failure. Well, here we're only talking about one, one alarm clock, so that's going to be 0.125. Okay, so then um, that will be the answer to their first question. It says round to three decimal places. Well, there's no need to. We already have 0.125 um, rounded to three decimal places. So one alarm clock should be easy. Um, but what makes this problem interesting is in part B, they say if the student has two alarm clocks where they're both assumed to have the exact same daily failure rate, what is the probability that they both fail on the morning of an important final exam? Okay. So um, what they're asking here is, actually, let me just turn that off. Um, they're asking the probability of two alarm clocks failing. In other words, the first fails and the second fails. I'm not going to write failure over and over again. We know, we know that we're talking about failures here in the problem. So this, this notation here, I mean, what is the probability that with two alarm clocks that the first fails and the second fails? In other words, they both fail. Well, these are considered independent events because they're separate alarm clocks. And if one fails, that's not going to change what happens with the other one. They're independent events. So and means we multiply the probabilities. So probability of the first failing and the second failing is going to be the probability of the first failing times the probability of the second failing, okay, which is 0.125 times 0.125, okay. Um, they're assumed to each have the same daily failure rate. So you literally just take the number that you converted to a decimal and you multiply it times itself. Um, and because we have two alarm clocks, we have two factors of 0.125. That's using the multiplication rule. So when you multiply those out on your calculator, you should get 0 0.0156. Um, so that gives us 0 0.0156. And I went ahead and rounded that to three significant figures. So starting at the first non-zero digit, there are a total of one, two, three digits. Okay. So one failure, that was part A. Um, two failures, the first one failing and the second one failing was part B. We got 0 0.0156, so let's go ahead and type that in. Oh, and, and they say round two, five decimal places here, so it looks like we need one more digit. So looking at my calculator was actually 0 0.01562, but the next digit is a five, so it's actually 0 0.01563. Okay. So I don't know why they're including four significant figures here, but you know, we have to abide by their rules. So. I went ahead and rounded to five decimal places as they told me to. Okay, so typing that in, we've got 0 0.01563. Okay, part C, in case you didn't get the pattern, we're still multiplying, but here they're asking what is the probability of not being awakened? if a student uses three independent alarm clocks. Um, so that's the same as asking us the probability of failure on the first and failure on the second and failure on the third. Okay, so 
part A was here, part B was here. Now we're doing part C. Um, so for part C, it's just the same pattern. It says we're going to be multiplying because we're talking about three alarm clocks. This is the probability of um, failure on the first and failure on the second and failure on the third, which is going to be the probability of first times probability of second times probability of third. Um, and then because I'm kind of running out of room here, let's just go ahead and multiply. So we know each of these probabilities is 0.125. So this is going to be 0.125 times 0.125 times 0.125. And by the way, if you know exponents, um, exponents are the same as repeated multiplication. So another way of writing these would be one failure would be 0.125 to the first power, two failures would be 0.125 to the second power, and then here we're talking about three failures, that would be 0.125 to the third power. Or you can, if you don't want to do exponents, there's only three factors here, so it's not too bad to type in 0.125 times 0.125 times 0.125. Not the end of the world. Okay, and then let's see what they said to round this to, because I don't want to be surprised again. So they say, let me just switch. They say round to five decimal places. Okay, so when I multiply these out on my calculator, we get um, 0 0.00195. So I went ahead and rounded that to five decimal places, which is kind of arbitrary. Um, but here that does happen to be three significant figures since there are three non-zero digits right there. Okay, so anyway, 0 0.00195. 0 0.00195. Okay, now we're done doing the math part of this question. Now in part D, they're asking us more of a conceptual science question. Do the second and third alarm clocks result in greatly improved reliability? Well, why don't you think about this for a second? The numbers that we got were representing the chance of failure. And obviously, if in their, in their story here, with these really crappy alarm clocks um, that have a 12.5% daily failure rate, what these numbers represent is the chance of the person, the student, not waking up for their final. And uh, if their teacher isn't nice, they might not get a makeup final. Um, which is just, you know, part of life, not having a makeup test, makeup final. Um, and in that case, uh, I would say that since the chances are getting a lot smaller for a failure, I would say that the second alarm clock went from 12.5% chance of not waking up to only a 1.563% chance of not waking up. And then going from the second to the third alarm clock, that went down to a 0.195% chance of not waking up. So in their uh, particular example here, I would say that the, the second and third alarm clocks definitely helped a lot. Um, they, they drastically lowered the chances of the student not waking up for their exam. So let's see what they wrote here so we can choose the correct answer. So do the second and third alarm clocks result in greatly improved reliability? I would say yes. So it's either going to be choice B or choice D. 
Reading choice B, they say yes, because you can always be certain that at least one alarm clock will work. That's not true. These are really uh, terrible alarm clocks. Um, we can't be certain that any of them work. Um, I don't know where they got these alarm clocks, but they probably shouldn't even sell them at the 99 cent store if they're that unreliable. So choice D says yes, because total malfunction would not be impossible, but it would be unlikely. All right, so for the second and third alarm clocks, the chance of failure for all three alarm clocks was only 0.195%, which is not impossible, it's not zero, but it is unlikely, which is good because you wanna make, most people wanna wake up and take their exam and hopefully get a good grade in the class. Okay, so I'm gonna go with choice D here. All right, so I know this is kind of a challenging homework, so I'm hoping that this video helps a lot, and also with the quiz. So um, that is it for this video. Thank you for watching. I will see you guys next time. Have a good day.